Thank you, Pastor Shear. And also, thank you, Mark, for uh, your kind introductions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, and I want to make some fine points tonight. I mean, not maybe fine in terms of how good it's going to be, but a lot of this is going to be somewhat detailed, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I think that the distinction and the articulation of the three estates is one of the most neglected and important doctrines of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, yes, even in our day. And I hope that this conference, if anything, will bring greater clarity so that we would understand from learning about these estates how we live our lives as Christians in this world, especially as saints who have been called to hear the Word of God, as uh, members of the family, uh, who have parents and children, how we are to love and honor one another, and also as citizens, or perhaps even members of the government. All three of these estates are governed and set in order by what we learn about in God's Word. And as we uh, uh, hear from God's Word and our Lutheran uh, confessions over the next two days, I hope that it's a benefit to us, that we are able to uh, listen and gain understanding, especially, especially as the devil and the demons and the powers of this world try to drive wedges between these estates, especially as they try to break down these estates to the point where the state tries to eat up the family, or the family tries to, you know, take over and replace the church, or even as the church tries to supplant the other two estates. Now, I was ignorant of this doctrine growing up in the mainstream Missouri Synod, congregation, and home. But that was not for lack of resources. And in fact, I think my dad knew something about this. He tried to teach me. But so one of the things I hope to demonstrate tonight, especially, is that as we learn about the three estates, we'll find that we don't have to go out of our way, really, to take this doctrine to heart. But in fact, we already have it in the clear commands of Jesus that institute preaching, uh, the clear commands in God's Word that talk about uh, the extent and the limits of the government's authority, and also as we meditate on you know, the Fourth Commandment, what it says to parents and children. We have the resources, we just kind of have to open our eyes to take it to heart, and to realize exactly what we have said before us. Now, when I was growing up, I used to satisfy myself when I consider my place in life, especially as a Christian with regard to the state, I used to satisfy, satisfy myself with vague notions of, well, I don't know, uh, the distinction between the church and the state, or the separation between the church and the state, uh, that was taught in grade school. It basically boiled down to what we call the no establishment and the free exercise clauses in the First Amendment. The church is supposed to stay out of the business of the state, the state is supposed to stay out of the business of the church. And then in my mind, what came from that was this sort of hard separation uh, between the sacred and the secular. Even to the point where, really, my life could often be defined as a sort of compartmentalization between the things that I do at church and in church, right? And the things that I do in the rest of my life, when I go to public school, you know, when I sit down to watch a movie with my family, all of that was part of a secular realm, where a secular conversation was taking place. But when I went to church, you know, here was the place where I would hear about sacred things and holy things, and hear about a language that was unknown in the other parts of my life. Now I have the feeling that this vague principle of church and state state separation, I, I have the feeling that this isn't an isolated experience that I have, that it's something that's more general, something that's more common to people in the church. And I think it probably shows up when in the church uh, we like to talk about political issues, and we like to talk about uh, issues that have their place in the pulpit, right? Some things have this political label slapped on them, and they happen to be sadly, I think, uh, some of the great sins of our age. And so it's political, I've heard, when your pastor wants to talk about abortion from the pulpit. The idea is that this is something that belongs to the 
secular realm. It's part of the secular conversation. It takes place in the public square. In fact, when I come to church, the things that belong out there in the world really should be cut off in some ways from the conversation that happens between the preacher and the hearer. The political label has made its way to be slapped onto things like divorce and homosexual marriage and homosexuality in general. Now, if we continue to keep ourselves in a vague and inarticulate notion that the church and the state ought to be separated, there's no way that we can answer people when they tell us that certain topics have their place in the public realm, in the public square, and other conversations really be, ought to be kept to the pulpit. Like when the pastor tells you about love and God and these sorts of things. But dear saints, there's a better way. Jesus doesn't want to muzzle his church. Nor does he desire lawlessness to prevail in the public realm just because no one has enough courage to tell the emperor that he has no clothes. It's true that Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, but that doesn't mean that his kingdom is to be draped in a kind of mystic silence as far as the world is concerned. And just as Jesus preached his kingdom before Pilate, without fear, speaking plainly about it, and so he expects also his Christians to confess his name and his doctrine before men. He says that we must confess his name before princes, rulers, and secular authorities, as we read about in Luke chapter 21. Now there is an order to how this conversation ought to take place. So that fathers know what they ought to say to their children. So that pastors know what they should say to the fathers and the princes. And so the princes know just how far their authority extends and where it should stop with regard to the church. And that's what I hope to explore tonight as we uh, talk about the intersection between the two kingdoms and the three estates. And so I want to start by uh, speaking about a little bit about the history and the context from which this Lutheran uh, doctrine of the three estates came about, especially in the writings of Martin Luther and at the time of the Reformation. And then from there, I want to explore a possible synthesis between the, the, the two doctrines of the, of the two kingdoms and then also the three estates. And then from there, I want to add a few comments if we have time. We don't have a lot of time tonight. So maybe the other pastors who come and present will be able to talk about this. Uh, I want to suggest some reasons why we actually have not had a conversation about the three estates in the Missouri Synod, at least not for very long. There are some historical reasons for this, and I want to make a few of them clear to us. All right, so as a quick refresher, when we talk about the doctrine of the two kingdoms, right, when we listen to uh, uh, Pastor Harrison, uh, President Harrison, uh, give his little uh, YouTube videos and stuff like that, and, and his talks about the two kingdoms, I listened to an hour-long presentation last night that was posted on World Beer Everlasting, where President Harrison was talking about the two kingdoms, and I found it very hopeful. And what President Harrison is drawing from are a couple of key sources in Luther's writings. Uh, in one, Luther writes, God has ordained two governments, the spiritual by which the Holy Spirit produces Christians and righteous people under Christ, and the temporal, which restrains the unchristian and the wicked, so that, no thanks to them, they are obligated to keep still and to maintain an outward peace. And again, Luther writes, there are two kingdoms, the temporal, which governs with the sword and is visible, and the spiritual, which governs solely with grace and with the forgiveness of sins. Now Luther wants us to recognize that Jesus rules from the Father's right hand in two very distinct ways. Jesus has given us the gift of outward authorities, of external authorities like fathers and princes who wield the sword. With the sword, they punish wrongdoers, they uphold virtue, they take taxes, and they threaten violence if the law is transgressed. All this 
they do by force. All this they do by compulsion. Now, second, on the other hand, Jesus tells us that he desires to rule in this world not only through the mediation of these temporal authorities who bear the sword and punish wickedness, who have the law on their side in reason, right? He also wants to rule among us with his gospel. Jesus desires not only to have the actions of our hands, right, that are, that are, uh, uh, that are compelled by threats of violence, he also desires to have our hearts, and he has our heart because he gives us the Holy Spirit. Jesus has us in his kingdom of grace because he has died for us upon the cross. Jesus has us because he has given preachers to teach, to proclaim that it is not by works that we are saved, but it is because of his righteousness given freely to us by the promise that we receive by faith, even a faith worked and wrought in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now these two kinds of authority, these two swords, one in the left hand of Jesus and one in the right hand of Jesus, could not be more distinct. And yet Jesus is pleased to use each one. But at the same time, we can see, and this is Luther's point, to mix the sword on the left hand that has the law and compulsion and force with the sword in the right hand, which is freedom and forgiveness and grace and mercy, is to destroy both. It's the same as mixing law and gospel, which leads to both lawlessness and despair. And to that end, I think that our synod has actually done a really good job of holding forth this doctrine so that we don't fall into the traps of thinking that our country ought to be a theocracy, right? That our uh, princes, our ruling officials, the people that we elect to Congress and the executive branch, uh, the people who are appointed judges, that they should be preachers, right? They don't have the office nor the command of God to hold forth the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. For that, Jesus has given us pastors, right? So we don't want a theocracy on the other hand, nor on the other hand do we want, uh, uh, nor on the other hand do we desire uh, uh, the, in the church that we would mix up the preaching of the forgiveness of sins and the power of the gospel with the compulsion of the law, right? That somehow by our civil obedience and even our obedience to, to fathers and to pastors that we're somehow saved. That's not true. And for that matter, the state ought to stay out of the business of the church. Now, the main sources of, of this doctrine, probably, so the one and the most well-known is on temporal authority and to what extent it should be obeyed. And then again, we have uh, how Christians should regard Moses. Both of these are from about the mid-1520s uh, in, in the writings of Luther. But nevertheless, Luther continues to write and to articulate matters uh, of the church and worldly governance. But as he does so, he changes how he, start, how he speaks about it. And he, speaks, he starts to speak more and more about what he calls the three orders or estates. And in fact, if you, anybody who has had any time, spent any time reading Luther and sort of the expanse of his works, I've only started to scratch the surface. Um, and yet, I, I can tell that you have much more of Luther speaking about the three orders and estates than you have of Luther speaking about the two kingdoms, or the two governances, or the two authorities, right? And in fact, Oswald Bayer, a, a leading Luther scholar, he says that uh, uh, Luther's own testimony shows that the teaching about the three estates carries much greater weight for him than the teaching of the two realms of God. The teaching about the two realms does not appear in those texts that offer summaries and testaments. Now that is important to know. That when Luther writes a document that he knows will carry weight, more weight than his other documents, such as his 1528 Great Confession Concerning Christ's Supper, such as his treatise on the councils of the church, then we hear Luther, especially there, speaking about the estates. Now, we have to think about this. Uh, that buyer's right. Uh, there's a wide selection of, uh, uh, of Luther's mature writings when we hear about the estates. Um, 
But in Bayer's mind, he has this idea that Luther kind of transitions from one way of looking at the matter to another. And Bayer says, like a lot of scholars say, that you find in Luther an amazing versatility, others say an inconsistency, in the way that he speaks about a given subject. Um, that for Bayer, when the context demanded it, especially in his earlier writings, he was willing to talk about the two governments. That's what he desired to do. Uh, but in his later writings, as Luther become, became more sort of secure in his place in Wittenberg and his relationship with the, the German princes, then it started to trans transition into the three estates. Uh, and it, and if for that matter, uh, Bayer says that when we try to synthesize, or we think that there ought to be a relationship between the way Luther talks about uh, the three estates and the two kingdoms, it's not going to work. Such a uh, synthesis, synthesis he calls uh, glib or too facile, I suppose. How do you say that? A French person knows how to say that. Facile, facile, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, that's what Bayer says, that we shouldn't do what I'm about to do, but I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> now, what are the three estates? In the history of the Middle Ages, there were some very firm and, and sort of articulate ideas about what the three estates are. And I think we should be aware of that history, and you probably already are. Especially if you think back to your Western civilization classes that you had in high school, and then again in college, right? Do they still have Western civilization classes? <laughs> oh, man. So, in those classes, I mean, I remember them teaching me this. Uh, so, the society in the medieval world was divided up in three ways. And you can kind of think about it, uh, and you can kind of think about it like this. Oh, here's a mark. You have, let's call this the castle, right? And then, surrounding the castle on the hill, you have all these farms where the people are planting and growing, right? And then next to the castle, or perhaps within the castle walls, you also have a church. This is basically the outline of the three estates. You have the nobility, that is, the fighting class of people uh, you have the workers who work the land, who gain wealth, so that the nobility would have freedom from working so as to fight and to defend the realm. And then you have, watching over both the rulers and the workers, the spiritual class, the clergy. And the clergy, they did their work by praying for the rulers and for the workers. It's good to know and to notice this, that uh, oaths are bound up to this. So when the uh, uh, ruler ascends to his office as prince, he swears to defend the realm. So also, uh, the, uh, uh, the people who are defended by the liege lord swear fealty to their lord. And then also, you have special oaths that are being sworn by the clergy. Namely, oaths that separate them out from the rest of the Christians. So the expectation is, all, is that all of these people are to be baptized. But not all Christians are the same. There is an oath of chastity and celibacy. There is the oath of poverty. There is the oath of obedience. These oaths that are bound up to what the Roman Church would call the Evangelical Councils, where the really, really hard law that we read about in, in Jesus' Sermon in the, on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, right? Now when they swear these oaths, they bind themselves to the Evangelical Councils, and they ascend to a new sort of spiritual kind of life. There's a two-tiered Christianity. I, this is the key part. There are those who have sworn the oaths of obedience and chastity and poverty, and there are those who have not. For some people, it is given to them to obey and to do the hard law of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. For the other people, for even for the nobility and for the, uh, and for the peasants, for them, the Ten Commandments is enough. For them, Moses is enough to do those works. Now, uh, this idea about the three estates. Albrecht Peters, in his commentary on Luther's catechisms, uh, he makes this really bold claim. He says that the idea in and of itself 
stretches all the way back to Plato, uh, when Plato talks about what the craftsmen, the guardians, uh, and uh, the, the, the warriors, and this sort of stuff, or the rulers, I think. And I think he's, I don't know, I, I, I think he might be right about that. I vaguely remember reading something about that in the Republic. Um, but nevertheless, uh, despite how old the three estates may or may not be, the key thing is that among Plato and Aristotle, among the Stoics, even among Philo, right, the Hellenizing Jew who would do a commentary on the, on the Decalogue and the Ten Commandments, all of them saw that life ought to be ordered, and ordered in very specific ways, and that the family had a central place in the world. And from the office of fathers and children came uh, also the authority of, of rulers and subjects, and that also there was a place for the uh, there was also a place for the um, uh, for the, the people who pray to exercise their spiritual authority over others. Now, up into the time of the New Testament, the sort of idea of an ordered life in this world uh, uh, was especially put forward by uh, these sort of virtuists. So the Stoics love their virtuists. Uh, they would list those things that a man ought to do to be a virtuous man. And it included, uh, you know, if, if, I am, uh, if I am to be a ruler, I rule wisely. If I am to be a subject, I obey faithfully. Uh, and so also you would have uh, the uh, uh, Aristotle articulating sort of the prime virtues uh, that were the medium between the two extremes of life, right, of the passions. Instead of being rash and rushing off into battle, leaving my comrades behind, and instead of being a coward and fleeing to the back, I would instead stand on the front line in a temp with temperance and in true courage. Now, uh, and, and uh, uh, so also when Philo picks up the Ten Commandments and studies them and, and works these things out, uh, uh, he stops on the Fourth Commandment especially and, and talks about the office of Father. Now from the office of Father we have all other sorts of authorities on this world. And then he has a list of the things that ought to be done by the fathers and the things that ought to be done by the children and the rulers and the subjects and all this other stuff. In the writings of the New Testament, of course, you know all about this. In Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, in Titus, and in 1 Peter, there you see Peter and Paul giving Christians a list of the things that we ought to do and those, uh, 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 that, that, uh, the obedience that ought to be rendered unto the law. Right? And so we find the same sorts of expositions concerning the office of Father. Now all of this actually dries up. I mean, you find some of this in the writings of the early church fathers. Uh, but by the time the middle, by, by the time the Roman Empire falls, by the time the Middle Ages start in earnest, the virtue lists fall away. What you're left with is sort of a vague or, or politi political or philosophical notion of the three estates. You would think that maybe they would use these lists, these lists to teach people good works and virtue as an aid in confession, right? Actually, what Luther does in the Table of Duties in a small catechism. But in fact, it wasn't until the time of Gerson, who was sort of a generation before Luther, that you find anything of the sort. It's kind of a revolutionary thing that Luther is doing, putting a table of duties at the end of the catechism, and then asking the question in this short order of, of confession, what is, my off, or, or what is my station in life according to the Ten Commandments? It was going back to this ancient wisdom and to the, and to the scriptures, rather than running, all, running back to this old political philosophy of the three estates. Now, when we go through, uh, 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 we talked about the oaths that were sworn, um, and the distinction between the Christians, between the spiritual class and between the secular class of uh, Christians. But something happens, of course, during the time of the Reformation. Something happens even with the law at the time of the Reformation. Suddenly, the law, Luther discovers, convicts not only the secular people, the people who are supposedly given special grace so as to remain faithful to their oaths and uh, attain a greater certainty of their salvation, Luther perceives that the law actually convicts them of their sin. It is not a ladder of righteousness to reach God. Not only does it convict the spiritual class, those people who had holy orders, it also convicts everybody else who thought that they, by merely doing the, the works of the Ten Commandments, that they would become righteous in God's sight. No, according to Luther, the law convicts us of sin, it condemns us, and it damns us to hell. But of course, when the law has done its work, what do we find in the Holy Scriptures? But the righteousness of Christ, 
the righteousness of God revealed apart from the law, apart from the works of the law, right? And this brings about in Luther an incredible recognition that when the old uh, orders that separated Christians from those who couldn't do the, 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 the new law that Jesus brought from those who could, right? When that, all, when that all breaks down under the crushing weight of the second use of the law, the mirror that shows us our sins, then what we're left with is actually a clear picture of both the gospel, as the scriptures teach, and also of the true holy orders in life. That suddenly the Ten Commandments no longer, no longer become something for the weak Christians. The Ten Commandments becomes the way of ordering a Christian life that is best and most pleasing to God. You don't have to run beyond the Ten Commandments to find something better, right? You don't have to run beyond the earthly kind of life that's given to us in the Ten Commandments. Now, you can do the things that the Ten Commandments say and know that your life is pleasing to God, right? I don't have to run into a monastery. Now I can be a father. I don't have to run away and join a convent. Now I can be a daughter, right? Now I don't have to flee my secular office as a prince in this world to become a monk so I can be more certain of my salvation and my progress towards my justification. Now I can do that and know that Jesus still loves me and saves me, not because of the law, but because of grace and the gospel. It's good for us to think about where Luther articulates this best and most clearly, and actually what sets up what Luther says in his catechisms, especially in the small, especially in the small catechism when he articulates the table of duties. In his great confession of 1528, he writes, I reject and condemn as sheer deceptions and errors of the devil all monastic orders, rules, cloisters, religious foundations, and all other such things devised and instituted by men beyond and apart from the scripture. See Luther's point? These vows of obedience, of, 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 uh, uh, of obedience, of chastity, and of poverty, these, these things were things that were, 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 were better laws than the Ten Commandments. They were designed by men to go beyond the righteousness required by the Ten Commandments. Right? He says that I reject and I condemn those who are bound by vows and obligations, although many great saints have lived in them, and as the elect of God are misled by them even at this time, yet finally by faith in Christ Jesus have been redeemed and have escaped. Because these monastic orders, foundations, and sects have been maintained and perpetuated with the idea that by these ways and works men should seek and win salvation and escape from sin and death, they are all a notorious, abominable blasphemy, a denial of the unique aid and grace of our only Savior and Mediator, Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given by which men must be saved than this which is Christ Jesus. And it is impossible that there should be more saviors, ways, or means to be saved than through the one righteousness, which is our Savior, Jesus Christ, which he has bestowed upon us and offered to God for us, indeed, his own blood upon the mercy seat of God. But the holy orders and the true religious institutions established by God are these three. The office of priest, the estate of marriage, the civil government. All who are engaged in the clerical office or ministry of the word are in a holy, proper, good, and God-pleasing order and estate, such as those who preach, administer sacraments, supervise the common chest, sextants, and messengers, or servants, or all who serve such persons. These are engaged in works which are altogether holy in God's sight. And so Luther points us to the true holy orders. He points away from the made-up orders of, of the uh, you know, the Benedictine monks, uh, the holy orders of the Dominicans, or uh, the Augustinian friars. Instead, he points us to the very simple command of God given in the third commandment, that the Sabbath day should be kept holy. And of course, knowing your small commandment, you know how the third commandment is actually, next, is actually a, a, a defense and a wall against uh, the preaching of God's word. That is, I don't mean it's a, a wall against it, like to keep preaching out. Rather, the wall is set up by the law to defend 
this work, this good and godly work, preaching God's grace and the forgiveness of sins, uh, to, uh, uh, to save us from sin and death, right? G uh, Luther would point us to the very basic and simple institution and command of Jesus that we read about in John chapter 20, when he breathes on his disciples and he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever has sinned, you, you forgive, it is forgiven them. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. And then again, Jesus tells his preachers, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And concerning the hearers of this word, he says, My sheep hear my voice. All this belongs to the third commandment. Luther goes on and says, Again, all fathers and mothers and, and uh, all those who regulate their household wisely and bring up their children to the service of God are engaged in pure holiness, in a holy work, in a holy order. Similarly, when children and servants show obedience to their elders and masters, here too is pure holiness, and whoever is thus engaged is living a saint, is, is a living saint on earth. So, on the one hand, you have the third commandment, right? Everything that, uh, the, there you have uh, the holy order that is governed by uh, God's command to keep the Sabbath holy. It's kept holy by preaching in God's word and hearing it. And so also in the fourth commandment, we have the next holy order of parents, uh, 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 parents who are to care for their children, to bring them up in the fear and the instruction of the Lord, as we learn about in Ephesians chapter 6. And also the very basic commands of the children, to render honor and obedience to their parents. Moreover, princes and lords, Luther writes, judges, civil officers, state officials, notaries, male and female servants, and all who serve such purpose, uh, persons, and further, all their obedient subjects are all engaged in pure holiness and leading a holy life before God. For these religious institutions or orders are found in God's word and commandment. And whatever is contained in God's word must be holy. For God's word is holy and sanctifies everything connected with it and involved in it. So, so this is it. Luther says that no longer are we going to come up with a new and greater law for ourselves, but now we're going to recognize that the law obtains to all the baptized, and the law is nothing other than this. The Ten Commandments especially the Ten Commandments as they hinge and sort of uh, and, and revolve around the Third and the Fourth Commandments, right? That through preaching and God's Word on this hand, you are engaged in the estate of the Church. Uh, and on the other hand, where, where there is authority uh, to protect your life, to bring you up in the fear and the instruction of the Lord, even here on the second table of the law where the sword is wielded to punish wickedness and to uphold virtue, this is good and godly, and we can see how it flows naturally out of the fourth commandment. Luther goes on to talk about the same sort of arrangement or order in, in uh, different ways. He sometimes calls them three arch powers or hierarchies. Other times he calls them the true spiritual life, the true temporal government, the true home life. Uh, uh, but you see the point. Um, that now we don't need anything beyond the Ten Commandments that for Christians to define how we should live in this life, uh, the Ten Commandments are, are not uh, are enough. We don't have to distinguish ourselves into those people who do holy things and spiritual things apart from a worldly, earthly life. Instead, we ought to find it exactly where the Ten Commandments locate us already. Now, uh, we should jump back to this. We have about 15, or how much time do I have? I should ask someone. 15 minutes left? We'll jump back to this. And this is, uh, uh, what does it mean then when we talk about the three estates in relationship to the two powers? And it's this, and I think you can find it in the Augsburg Confession. The key to understanding the relationship between the two, especially in Article um, 16, where we, at, where we see that in the Augsburg Confession, the three estates is something that is asserted uh, clearly and plainly, even though many times our eyes pass over and we never think about it twice. Yet the three estates, as Luther articulates them in his great Confession of 1528, his small catechism in the Table of Duties, right? Remember how the Table of Duties is uh, split up, by the way. Uh, 
He, he, t he says what is commanded to preachers and what is commanded to hearers, all from the New Testament, right? So not to think that these things are only to the Jews and the Israelites. And then after that, he, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, what, what, uh, 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 what ought to be uh, rendered unto, uh, 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 or what, what is the duty of the governors and the, and the, and the civil uh, and, uh, citizens. And then again, what, uh, uh, what is the relationship between fathers, masters of households, and children and servants, right? Uh, so that is, so it, sometimes when we look at the table of duties, it, our eyes sort of pass over the little titles uh, that we find in there. But nevertheless, there's the threefold distinction, and especially pay attention to the words in which, with which Luther introduces the table of duties. What does he call it? He calls them holy orders, and he does that on purpose, because these are the new holy orders by which Christians ought to live, and they are nothing other than the Ten Commandments, right? So anyways, uh, uh, the, three, the, the three estates are asserted in the uh, Augsburg Confession, especially in Article 16, where we confess... Uh, because the gospel transmits an eternal righteousness of the heart, they, that is the Lutheran uh, princes also, or I'm sorry, they are the, the theologians uh, that live in the lands of the Lutheran princes also condemn those who lo locate evangelical perfection, not in the fear of God and in faith, but in abandoning civil responsibilities. That's very much like what Luther is trying to get at by talking about uh, how he rejects all the holy orders, right? Uh, all these newfound ways to obtain righteousness before, the, uh, before God by going beyond the Ten Commandments. Huh. So also the Lutherans are rejecting anything that talks about evangelical perfection apart from the law and gospel. They say that in the meantime, the gospel does not undermine, I'm sorry, undermine government or family but completely requires both their preservation as ordinances of God and the exercise of love in these ordinances. Consequently, Christians owe obedience to their magistrates and laws except when commanded to sin, for they owe greater obedience to God than to human beings. Right? So we have, um, uh, so we have uh, clearly asserted the, the, uh, the estate of the church, right? and where true evangelical perfection is found, namely in the preaching of the law that crushes us, and then in the perfection given to us in the righteousness of Christ that we have by faith in His gospel. And then they say that this doesn't undermine the earthly relationships that we have in this life by virtue of being born, right? Instead, it holds up our moms and our dads. It holds up the fact that we have kids we ought to care and love them and protect them. It holds up the fact that there are people who serve in government who bear the sword uh, to fight back uh, 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 the enemies who would attack our borders and even keep the lawless people off the streets. The Lutheran confessors say that we ought to render them obedience up until the point where they command us to sin. That is, when they them, themselves, who are supposed to be uh, sort of uh, uh, stewards of the Ten Commandments, try to step beyond the Ten Commandments, to say something beyond the Ten Commandments, when they try to do that, that is when the Christian ought to, to tell either a, a mother or father or a governor, uh, no, I will not do this because uh, you must obey God rather than man. Now, a few words about this. In the Article 16, um, it is actually directed less against the Papists <laughs> and more against the Anabaptists. But they're all caught up in the same error. They're all caught up in the same deception because the Anabaptists, like the Papists, uh, sought a man-made righteousness of works which necessitated going beyond the Ten Commandments. So on the one hand, the, 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 the Pope tried to destroy the government by claiming for himself the sword of the left hand. He wished to also bear uh, uh, the sword that, uh, that inflicted temporal punishments and violence and coercion, right? And in that way, and, and so also the Pope tried to undermine the familial estate uh, by claiming that celibate lives were more holy than, than lives uh, uh, in, in a family setting between a husband and wife united in marriage who have children, right? But also see how the Anabaptists couldn't content themselves with how God reigns among us in this world, even in his kingdom of the left, right? And with the sword, and even in the kingdom of the right with his promise. Rather, it was necessary to overturn the rulers and the authorities to institute God's kingdom upon this earth. 
a kingdom governed by the sword. And so remember Munzer and his revolt, right? And so also they tried to abandon worldly offices, offices such as civil magistrates and such, right? In an attempt to live a more pure and holy life, a life disentangled from the messiness of having to love your neighbor and of having the opportunity of being sinned against and sinning against someone. The Romans and the radical reforms both had the same problem. God desired them uh, to be baptized and to live in the world and not to abandon it, but rather to remain within the Ten Commandments. But instead they wanted to go beyond it. All because they were caught up in this delusion that righteousness comes by the law. In some ways, you know, the law has its, its use, right? The law has its purpose. You see the law in the Ten Commandments, right? But imagine trying to pick up, pick up the Ten Commandments as a tool or as a ladder to reach God. And the very use of the commandments in that way, they become warped and they become less than what you would want of them, right? In fact, it becomes something that gets bent out of shape to the point where you have to try to imagine a, a better thing, to invent the wheel again, right? Now, that is... Uh, 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 so, nevertheless, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. I wanted to say a couple of things about how this was speaking as much against the Anabaptists as Luther was speaking against the Roman, the, the Roman Church. Both had fallen into the same deception and error. Now, later, in Article uh, uh, 28, uh, we don't have an articulation of the three estates as we do in Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession. Instead, in Article uh, uh, 28, uh, they speak directly about the two kingdoms, as we would call them, or as they call it, uh, uh, the uh, two powers, or the two authorities. Um, and so it says, in former times, there were serious controversies about the power of bishops, in which some people uh, improperly mixed the power of the church with the power of the sword. Our theologians have taught that, for the sake of God's command, everyone should honor and esteem with all reverence both the authorities and powers as the two highest gifts from God on earth. That is, those who have the power of the gospel, the command to preach, and forgiveness of sins, those people who wield the law to punish outward wickedness and these sorts of things. Our people teach as follows. According to the gospel, the power of the keys or of the bishops is the power and command of God to preach the gospel, to forgive or to restrain sin, and to administer and distribute the sacraments. For Christ uh, sent out the apostles with this command. As my Father has sent me, so I have sent you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And so on. The same power of the keys or of bishops is used and exercised only by teaching and preaching God's word. And by administering the sacraments. To many persons or individuals according to one's calling. Not bodily, but eternal things and benefits are given in this way. Such as eternal righteousness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. Secu secular power does not protect the soul, but using the sword and physical penalties, it protects the body and goods against eternal violence. And this leads the confessors to conclude, this is why one should not mix or confuse the two authorities, the spiritual and the secular, for the spiritual power has the command to preach the gospel and to minister to the sacraments for the salvation of souls. And it should not invade an alien office. And again, they say, the powers of the church and civil government must not be mixed. The power of the church possesses its own command to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. It should not usurp the other's duty, transfer it to the kingdoms, abrogate the laws of magistrates, abolish lawful ordinance, interfere with judgments concerning any civil ordinance or contracts, prescribe to magistrates laws concerning the form of government, and so on. So think about it in this way, guys. You have two powers. You have two authorities that are kept as distinct from, possible, from one another as possible. And what they're talking about, especially in Article uh, uh, 28, is uh, uh, why it's so important for us to understand that the Pope has no jurisdiction in trying to abrogate for himself or trying to grab the kingdom of uh, anything of the kingdom of the left. The sword of temporal punishments and authority of, of, of waging war and of compelling people through the law, right? Instead, he ought to recognize himself and all true Christian bishops and, print, and all true, 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 true Christian bishops and pastors ought to see themselves over here, the kingdom of the right, who have at their disposal only, properly speaking, the power of the gospel. So here we have the gospel and here we have the law. These are the two powers. 
This one leads to an outward obedience and yet to death spiritually. This one uh, gives us spiritual life, even eternal life before God. Now the way that, the, and, and this is where the three estates overlap on top of this. Once again, Byron might call this Basile or Glib, but I don't care. Here on the kingdom of the left, we have what we might call uh, uh, the uh, 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 civil government. Okay? Here in the kingdom of the right, where the gospel is the power and the authority, and the sword of the spirit, the word of God, we have especially uh, the church. Everything that belongs, uh, uh, everything that belongs to the church here. And then straddling the two, here in the middle, apparently Pastor Wolf Mueller has been teaching this for about 10 years now, and I'm only now catching up. Uh, here in the middle, we actually have the estate of parent. Why? Because we have articulate commands in God's word, where the parents are to bring up their children in the fear and the instruction of the Lord. That is, they are bound to teach their kids the law and the gospel for the salvation of their souls. Right? Ephesians chapter 6. So also, we have a, a, a command that parents should, you know, use the rod, and that they ought to uh, teach their children how to obey the law so that they don't end up in the hands of the hangman, as Luther says in his uh, work on temporal authority, and to what extent it should be obeyed, right? So there you have it. Uh, you have two distinct powers, and they are ordered in three different ways. Uh, and you can probably think about it in this way. For your pastor, he has the sword in his right hand, and really that is all he, all he has been authorized by Jesus to wield, uh, 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 to wield, you know, for the salvation of souls. He preaches the law, of course, right? He always preaches the law, but it's not to the same extent uh, as the civil magistrates who have the power of the law to kill. The pastor doesn't use the power of the law to kill. Rather, what the pastor does is he uses uh, the power of the law not to kill bodily, but spiritually. Uh, he doesn't actually pick up a sword, a literal sword, as St. Peter tries to do, and as he cuts off Malchus' ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember how Jesus rebukes him. That's not what he is to do. All who live by the sword die by the sword, which is a truism for everybody over here in the civil government. But for St. Peter, for Pastor Wolfmiel, or Pastor Milius, you know, for Pastor Packer back there, and all the pastors who are here, Pastor Burke, all that's been given to us really is the power to, to wield the sword of the God's Spirit in the Word, to save souls by this preaching. The parent has this order for him in both hands, right? by virtue of having both commands from God. Um, that did, that's not to say that the office of parent is somehow uh, uh, makes the office of, of, of the church unnecessary, right? Because once again, Jesus institutes the church uh, in, dis, in, sort of in, in distinct terms, apart from the fourth commandment. All right, now, uh, this, is a bit, this is a bit tricky, and it's a bit of, it is a bit of threading uh, the needle. But it is important to know that both when Luther talks about the two, the two kingdoms, and also when Luther talks about the three estates, he talks about it in this way. He'll always talk about the kingdom of the right as a kingdom that can save you. It can save you. Because what Luther is talking about is the actual preaching of the gospel, the promises of God to rescue you from sin and death, right? This kingdom will save you. Um, he says concerning the kingdom of the left, it will not save you. It can only threaten, uh, get violence and kill, right? And yet when Luther, in 1528, articulates the estate of the church, he doesn't keep it merely to the preaching and the faith that grabs a hold of the word. He actually includes other things that belong to the church. Uh, the other things that belong to the church outside of the narrow definition. Uh, he talks about, uh, 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 he talks about sextants, remember? He talks about the people who keep an eye on the money chest. He might as well be talking about the Senate and the International Center. These are all the things that belong to the order of the church. There is an order of, that, 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 that exists, right, in any given place where there's a congregation that sort of organizes the fact that you're going to have a church service on Sunday morning at some point, right? That's something that belongs to the law and, in fact, the third commandment, but it is not to be equated with the very preaching of the gospel that is the kingdom of the right and is equated with the sword of God's right hand. The law, in this case, the law of the third commandment, seeks to uphold and preserve uh, the preaching of the gospel, uh, uh, but, it does, but it ought not ever to be commanded, uh, or, I'm sorry, but it ought not ever to replace it or to be sort of confused with it. Because as Luther points out, all three of these things 
These two belong to the third. Uh, these two belonging to the uh, fourth commandment. This one belonging to the third commandment. They are still law. And in fact, after Luther gives this beautiful exposition of the uh, three estates, I see Joshua Sherrod standing up. Lord have mercy on us. I'll stop pretty soon. I Just give me two more minutes. Look, as soon as Luther explicates the three estates and calls them holy orders, right? He says that these orders will not save you. They cannot save you. All of them belong to the law. Even the order of the church, right? Even the order of the third commandment, that cannot save you. The only thing that can save you is the power of the gospel, the preaching of the forgiveness of sins. And so even though there is an external order in a way in which we can look at the church in this world and rightly call it the estate of the church, and see it as distinct from the estate of parents and civil government as the scriptures teach, still it ought never to be confused with the preaching of the gospel in itself. Right? If I have nothing, I, mean, I suppose if I have nothing else to say, that would be enough. Uh, just to understand that when we think of the kingdom of the left and the right, and especially as it boils down to the distinction between law and gospel, that the, when we talk about the estate of the church, it always means more than just merely the preaching of the gospel. It also includes some measure of the law. All right. Now, uh, the three estates... All right. Uh, uh, Pastor Shear, I see we're about done. <laughs> I kind of wish I could hold you all captive, but it is very hot here. And it is time for us to pray. So thank you for your time and attention. God's peace be with you all.